I have a lot of preamble. So first of all, Michigan Technological University. Michigan, I think we know where that is because it has a technological university. Yes, it does. So it's not well known. Very, I did not know about it before I actually went there. So it's in the upper peninsula of Michigan. So there's two parts of Michigan, and this is the upper part. So we're in the upper part. So it's a snow economy. And one thing I know about, um, well, people in the United States, particularly the southern United States, probably in California, is some people are horrified by snow. Like, oh my god, snow. But snow drives the economy in Houghton, Michigan. So we have downhill skiing, we have cross-country skiing, we have snowmobiling, we have all kinds of winter sports. So if we don't get snow, the local economy takes a major, major hit. I don't know how many years we could go with no snow. It would just devastate the economy, and that would be it. So we have tremendous amounts of snow moving equipment. People study how to move snow there, and uh, so we're fine. So we, get, we got about 300 inches, inches of snow this season, which was great. All right? So we're happy with our snow. Um, but a winter economy is not for everybody, I understand that. Uh, so this is the abstract, which is too many words to read. Why did I include this? Well, because if somebody asks me for a copy of my, my lecture, uh, then this pretty much sums it up. So don't read this. <laughs> this will sum it up. OK, so uh, know your lecture, so uh, about physicists and physics. So uh, way back, uh, just after fire was invented, I got um, uh, my degree in uh, my PhD from uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, something called microlensing. So it was realized for many years since I guess, uh, well back, I, actually Isaac Newton understood that it could happen. He didn't make any calculations. Einstein predicted its magnitude. Uh, many other people along the way discovered in the first sense, maybe in the uh, 70s, uh, but it's gravitational lensing. So gravity attracts everything typical gravity of, of compact objects. So it also attracts light. Light also attracts light, but that's another lecture. Um, so when it attracts light, you can get deflection of light. And so this was measured in 1919 to confirm general relativity. So one of the things I like to say is general relativity may or may not be correct, but we know gravitational lensing exists because we measure it. But general relativity is or the best theory of gravity we have. And, uh, should work until things get extremely dense or small. Um, so, uh, so microlensing is the is something on very small angular scale, typically the micro arc second scale. So it was dubbed uh, microlensing, uh, dubbed that by my thesis advisor at the time, which his name is Bodin Paczynski, who is a professor at Princeton. Who was even though I was at Penn, uh, I uh, would drive over to be at Princeton. Uh, to visit him. So how could that possibly work? Because many people's graduate careers, as well as undergraduate careers, don't go simply like you think it might. They, many of them are convoluted, and people go here, there, and everywhere. So my first thesis advisor at Penn didn't get tenure and left. And we were pretty close. My next thesis advisor didn't get tenure and left. OK, so you'd think I'd know better by then. Uh, so then, I was already working on stuff having to do with gravitational lensing because I thought that was really cool. And so it was determined by my, um, well, both of the thesis advisors that were, were leaving um, that they realized that we got preprints because we didn't have the, oh, now they're all the preprints are online on something called the archive, A-R-X-I-V. Uh, but back then, people would send out actual hard copy things they would let in the mail and be sent to the department. So based on that and uh, personal, not my personal, but their personal acquaintances, they said, oh, here's someone who's starting to work on this as well. And this was uh, Professor Brzezinski. So what happens is I went over there with uh, a professorial es escort from University of Pennsylvania to see if he's interested, if we could find common ground and he could be my scientific supervisor. And I think he was somewhat skeptical at first. But then um, I, I said, here's my way of thinking about this. He explained something, and I explained back my way of thinking about that, which was kind of crazy, because I can't do anything normal. And he said, that is essentially equivalent, but it's weird, but I will listen. You can come back and talk about it more. So then he realized that uh, 
uh, that like him, I was sort of like an idea person. And that I really got, I didn't like to do detailed calculations as much as I liked to, to think of ideas. So he would stop after a while telling me his ideas, which he expected me to work on. And he would sit there and he would listen to my ideas. And he would say, no, that doesn't work because of this. And he'd say, no, that doesn't work because of that. And he'd say, no, this one doesn't work either. And so one day, I gave him my, one of these months I went back, I'd go visit him every month. Uh, I would say, here's this idea about this. And he, would, he sat back and I was waiting for the what's wrong with this. And he said, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> So then I had something I knew I would complete my thesis then with him because by saying that also he was acknowledging that he would be he would stay on as my thesis advisor, so my scientific advisor. So I kept stayed at Penn because I don't know why, and I had an online official. No, I had an official advisor at Penn, um, uh, Robert Cook. I don't know if anybody knows him. Uh, okay, wow. Okay, he was my official advisor at Penn, but I would go over. So he would. He actually put more red ink on, the, on my thesis than anyone else, except Blitzstein, if you know who he is, but, um, um, who wrote more than I did in my thesis. Um, so anyway, so that was, so I did uh, microlensing in 1987, and the uh, microlensing wasn't discovered until like the mid-1990s. <coughs> so this was somewhat speculative. So I'm used to people saying, that's not how to get measured. Like, what? But Pachinsky wasn't like that. He thought, this was, this was really cool. Um, so... Um, I remember a couple of times I submitted a paper, worked really hard on a long paper, submitted it, and it was, came back from the referee saying, this is never going to be measured, so wh wh why are you sending this to us? Um, and it's true sometimes, but in other times it turns out I was able to get things published, and so I'm happy to say uh, somewhat conceitedly that I was able to predict several things before they were in mark lensing, before they were actually measured. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, so then... Uh, I uh, got my PhD, I followed the career trajectory that uh, Professor Kaminsky said. Um, I ended up, uh, so I was at Naval Research Lab uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, working with a mutual acquaintance under um, Kent Wood, who was a really cool guy. Um, so then I was, they put me in an office there, okay? So uh, they didn't have any real offices, but they had an office that they put places and equipment they didn't want to let go, okay? Because it might come in useful later. And this was not really, it was a lab that wasn't really being used as a lab anymore. So it became a really long countertop with some, some desks around the edges. And it also had a, a blue dot on it, which meant that it was, um, um, uh, what's, um, it was uh, not, it was, it was the name for something you're not supposed to release information for. Um, classified. classified, right. But nothing in there was classified. The reason why they had the blue dot on there was so that it wouldn't be stolen. <laughs> because things that are classified are locked at another level than things that are not. So, so a lot of the equipment they didn't want to be stolen was put in the lab and they put a blue dot on the lab and they had extra space. So I was put in that lab in the end. And it was like completely silent. But anyway, uh, so it was weird. I would spend hours in there and there would be nothing except there was one duct, one air duct. And this air duct would go over to another postdocs, uh, would come out or be connected somehow through this one other postdocs um, desk. And every now and then when he would laugh, I could hear him cackle. <laughs> that was it. That was the sound. So it was not a bad place to work. But at this place, there was a, another postdoc, not the cackler, um, who was named Jay Nars, and he went to NASA, got his space flight center, and he was, uh, they were launching Satellites, there's a new phenomena. Well, it was first discovered in the early 70s, late 60s, depending on whether you like strip chart recorders or not, and uh, called gamma ray bursts. And these gamma ray bursts were these huge explosions out in the universe, and nobody really knew what they were or even where they were. So the new satellite that was going up, called Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, um, had an instrument on it that would see a lot of these called BATSI burst and transient source experiment. Well, I actually got all those ones, this time, all the letters this time. And so Jay was building up his group. So I decided to go over there, which is actually a tough decision because the Naval Research Lab was sort of offering me a more permanent position. And the one at NASA Goddard was sort of a temporary position. So I had to decide whether I want to stay at a place that was not having the exciting data come in 
but it was a more permanent job, or, or should I go to a place that had the exciting data come in? And so I decided to take a gamble, and so I went to NASA Goddard, and so we worked on gamma ray bursts, which was really cool. Um, actually, I then realized that Pachinsky was also in dealing with gamma ray bursts. So we would measure attributes, the data would come in, and we would talk about what it was, and so we came up with a, we didn't come up with a paradigm. We started to back a paradigm, partly because of, I, I'm so interested in cosmology, that gamma ray bursts could be cosmological in origin and not in our galaxy. So these huge, huge flashes of light and gamma rays that were occurring in the universe, where were they? Were they just nearby in our solar system? Some people thought that. Were they in our galaxy? You know, like, we knew lots of neutron stars in our galaxy, and maybe things were falling onto neutron stars, or maybe neutron stars were, were going, falling in together in our galaxy, or maybe they were well out in the universe. So we started publishing a series of papers that gamma ray bursts were consistent with coming from cosmological distances. And so we had some of the, the key papers there. We were not the only people who believed that. Actually, it goes back to Vandenberg in the 80s, who suggested that. Pachinsky also believed that and published on that. So um, it was actually determined in the, let's see, late 1990s, I think, that um, gamma ray bursts were actually coming from cosmological distances. So that was pretty cool that that worked out. Um, so when at NASA Goddard, uh, I was one postdoc hired by Jay Norris, and the second postdoc hired by Jay Norris was someone uh, called, whose name was Jerry Bunnell. And so he sat, I sat at one desk, and he sat at other desk, and we would talk about stuff. And then what would happen is, every year for about a month, our boss on the project, Jay Norris, would go off and build his retirement ranch, which I think was in Colorado, but it turns out he's moved to Idaho, and I'm not sure exactly where. It's one of those places. And so he'd come back and he'd have pictures of clearing brush and stuff like that, because this is where he is going to retire. And so during that month away, Jerry and I would just go off and we were like home alone with NASA computers. And we would still do our gamma ray burst stuff. We would just do crazy stuff. So the, the one year, we decided to compute digits of irrational numbers to see if they were truly random. Uh, so that, we got in trouble because we were creating these files that were too large. They were like 10, 20 megabytes large. And back in the 1990s, that like clogged up your disk drive. And so people were complaining, what are these large files? And so this guy came down from IT um, and said, you were getting a lot of complaints. You know, how come you're creating these large files? And so we said, well, we're sort of trying to make, create a world record for the number of rational digits of the number E. And he said, that's really cool. How can I help? <laughs> so, then we <laughs> so then he helped fine, fine tune our desktop machines, which were DEC alphas, which were really fast in integer multiplication and, and stuff, so which helped us set what we thought was the world record. And we published the data online. So the next summer wasn't necessarily summer. Um, I think this one turned out to be the summer, though. Uh, Jay went away, and so Jerry and I were sitting around talking, and we were just brainstorming ideas. And one of the ideas was um, we're getting these emails of pictures, some from Hubble. And there's like no explanation, or sometimes the wrong explanation. At the same time, there's this thing called the World Wide Web that's, that's growing up. And there's all these interesting websites. Like, for instance, NASA now has a website. It's kind of boring, but you go to it, it has a website. Uh, it has, uh, you can go to the um, MST3K website. Does anyone know MST3K? Anyone hear about that? Mystery Science Theater 3000. <laughs> they had a website back then. So we said, let's, let's answer astronomy questions. But then we, that turned out it's too hard. Um, it takes too much time. Uh, let's do something completely different. But then it has nothing to do with astronomy. And we're sort of, we have to know a fair amount of astronomy because we both had PhDs in astronomy. So then we said, uh, let's take these images and post one a day and just give an explanation. Then people won't be getting them by email. There'll be a place they can go and get a short explanation that's right. And then we can just do all the major images. And then one question, before we started, we, had, we, we asked this question of ourselves, will we run out of images? And the answer we guessed was no, because the Ranger um, mission, NASA's Ranger mission to the moon, took hundreds of thousands of images of the lunar surface. 
So we could become really, really boring and show just another picture of the lunar surface and not repeat. But, but we were hoping that it wouldn't be true, that we would find other images. And so it, it turns out that now, uh, today we reject 10 images for every one we accept. So we get way more people submitting than not submitting. So we have well over 5,000. Actually, we do repeat uh, on purpose now, typically on Sundays, sometimes on Saturdays, sometimes other days, depending on whatever bizarre things are going on in our lives. But uh, so the astronomy picture today started in 1995. And um, so when Jay came back, we just kind of, kind of shy about um, mentioning it, because we had now been going for <laughs> a week or two. And uh, didn't really want to stop, but really felt he should know about it. So eventually, I think Jerry was the one who went and told him about it. And he came back and said, he thinks it's cool. So uh, we, we owe the, the longevity partly for, to um, Jay Norris, our boss, saying it was OK. Then we called over to the administration of NASA in another building. Building was maybe uh, it's building 21, 26, I don't remember. NASA got a space flight center. And uh, the nearest we could tell, they said things like, well, the World Wide Web is for scientists. So you scientists do what you want on this web. It doesn't concern us. The idea was they didn't want to have to have the additional administrative burden of having to try to administer all these web things that these scientists are doing. So they don't want to be involved. So keep us out of it. We don't want that burden. So we said, OK. And we just kept going. So that's 1995, uh, astronomy picture of the day. Still going. So it's easy to find apod.nasa.gov. Uh, now we are consistently, besides the, the top level nasa.gov domain, we are consistently the most popular website in the NASA domain, <laughs> beating out places like JPL. Um, so, and we're, we're like two people who do this. But we also, though, along the line, people have volunteered to help us. And so we, we used to say, oh, no, it's OK. But now, many times, people will publish their own foreign world language, sorry, edit, world language website uh, on a translation of APOD. So now we have like 20 different languages. And we don't pay these people. They, they volunteer to do this. Um, so our hits would go up and up and up. And then a few years ago, our hits started going down a little bit. And so we were concerned about why they're going down. And I think it's the rise of social media. So we used to do about a million page views a day. And then we started dropping 900,000 one year. The next year, 800,000. The next year, 700,000. So more people are going to social media. But we do have social media accounts, but they're not included in our NASA statistics. But then, about two years ago, it just stopped. And now we're slightly rising again. I think it's because people are tiring of Facebook, is my guess. But I don't know that for a fact. Our other Instagram is still really popular. Our fastest growing social media site is Instagram. It's just jumping. OK, so in 1999, I had left. Uh, Jerry and I are still friends. But, uh, but I had left uh, NASA Goddard, and I went to be a professor at Michigan Tech in, in Snow Country. And uh, so it occurred to me that science, I just have weird thoughts. I can't do anything normal. Um, science is becoming less falsifiable, less reliable, not more reliable with the advent of computers. Computers makes things much more, much more possible, things you can do. But it also, journals though, when you publish your results, you send it into a journal. The journals, they don't care, they don't ask, they, used, they want to know the equations, but they don't want to know back in 1999 anyway, they don't want to know what the code looks like. They just don't care. It's not what we do. Right? And so people, I would be reading papers and I said, oh, well, I'd like to see how that's coded. You know, that's a tricky bit right there. I wonder if that's coded correctly. I wonder if this science is really as falsifiable as the science was 50 years ago when you could see all the equations. And the answer is no, and there's no way to do that. The, the journal editors were saying, oh, no, we're not going to do that. And uh, you know, that's not something we're requiring of our authors. And the authors were saying, well, why would we do that? The time I'm, uh, first of all, everybody writes what's called spaghetti code. Right? Nobody's really proud of their code. It's always, well, there's kind of a go-to in there. And it's kind of like, I didn't give comments to this section. This other one, you know, the, the, the loop is really going for more than it should. But I'm not going to clean that up, because it's working, I think. Right? Uh, so I don't want to make it public. So this is one of our biggest problems. So, um, 
Still, what would you say to a paper that people said, well, I'm just going to describe the results. I don't want to give the equations because I don't know if this really is to the three halves power or to the second power. You know, I'm not really sure, so I'm not going to show you the equations. What would happen to science and physics and astronomy if we did that? Go to crap. Right? And so I could notice that some, I wasn't the only one to notice, other people noticed this, that some of um, physics and astrophysics was going to crap because people were hiding their codes. Not that they were really hiding it, they just said, well, I want to spend that time writing new grants, writing new papers. I don't want to spend time beautifying my code. But it was, you know, physics was going to crap. So I opened up the uh, astrophysics source code library in 1999 and said, okay, people are going to want to submit their codes, and then we can become, the codes could become falsifiable. So that when people submitted their science, you can now check their code, you can look at it, you can even run it, and say, oh, you know, I'm working on something similar, let me run this and see how that runs compared to what I do, or just, I don't have to do it now, because there it is. So no one submitted the code. Nobody cared. It's like, no, I'm going to spend my time writing more grants and more papers, I'm not going to submit my code. So. Um, we did get some. We had about 40. And then I turned it over. I, I advertised for a new editor uh, because I, we weren't getting lots of codes. And in about 10 years after that, 2009 or so, a new editor took over, uh, Alice Allen, and she was much more aggressive than I was. Uh, so she would go out and she would put codes into the Astrophysics Source Code Library, even if people didn't submit them, if they're in the public. She would create her own page for these things, right? And then she would hold sessions at the American Astronomical Society about why this is a good thing to do, why falsifiability is good for the entire discipline of, of astrophysics, and create pressure that way. So this pressure is now taking hold, and we now have over 1,800 codes in the Astrophysics Source Code Library that do almost everything. And now we're getting the attention of editors. And the editors are saying, yeah, it's now OK. If you're a referee, you can ask to see the code. And uh, now the American Astronomical Society has a slash software tag. And they're starting to encourage people to submit their codes. But we're still in the midst of this revolution. Also, the um, funding agencies are now slowly making more and more changes. Because a lot of people won't do this because um, they want to write more grants. But if you don't get the money from your last grant because you didn't release the codes, then you're going to release the codes. So, uh, so that's something that's, that's slowly happening. So the, one of the logic behind that is the US public, they paid for this research. They paid to see that code. Where's the code? We paid for it. So show it to us. So that's making some progress. So what? Yeah, OK, I'm sorry. OK. So um, a con camp, so I'll go a little bit faster. So, a con, so um, when I arrived at uh, Michigan Tech, uh, there was people there who had their expertises already. And so uh, I went through the idea folder of my mind and, and uh, realized that um, it was possible to do a continuous survey of the entire sky uh, with um, these fish. That we, first, we started with small parts of the sky. And then we did with, uh, went with fisheye cameras. So then we deployed to actually every major observatory uh, in the world these fisheye cameras that would watch the whole sky all night. And they would send back the information to, um, used to, we called it uh, nightskylive.net. We called them continuous cameras. So uh, that lasted for a while, but then I submitted another proposal to have the next generation and the National Science Foundation uh, previously happy said no, so because the observatories wanted to do it themselves, really. They didn't want to have to be, I'd actually, it was good for me because I was spending so much time uh, being the administrator of this and even though I didn't want it to fail, so I kept doing more and more administration, it's actually good for me to go on to something else. So now, uh, hard to find information about concams, but almost every major observatory still has an all-sky monitor. It's used mostly for cloud monitoring, but it is also used for transient monitoring. So I've been interested in cosmology, so I won't tell you about ultralight because I'm running um, late. Um, it's a different kind of uh, energy. Gamma ray bursts and fundamental physics, so I'm got some papers on that recently and last couple years, but I'll be telling you about something called special relativistic image doubling today. Something that sort of started with in 2015. Okay, so I won't get to all of this, but let's go to uh, the blinking lights paradox. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a bunch of questions and so people can think to themselves what it is. Please, if you know the answer, 
please don't call it out right away. For one thing, you might be wrong, and it'd be embarrassing. The other thing, you might be right, and then everybody says, well, I don't have to answer it now, because this person answered it. So please hold off on calling out answers. So let's say you have um, an illumination front of uh, blinking lights. And so the qu main question is, can an illumination front of blinking lights appear superluminal? So what does that mean? So let's say you have a row of lights blinking in sequence. Each light is seen to blink one second after the next. So let's say there's three lights. The simplest one. Here's light one. Here's light two. Here's light three. All right? So this one is off and then blinks on. And then a second later, this one is off and it blinks on. That one can be on or off, doesn't matter. And this one is off and this blinks on. Now, if you, it seems like there's a wave moving from left to right. So the question is, how fast can that wave move from left to right? Um, so you find out then that I have some kind of superpower, and these lights are actually um, very far away. Um, how far did I say? Light years. So they're, they're, they're 100 light years away, each of these. But you still see them light up one after the next. So the question is, does the wave of blinking lights exceed C? The, this one, then this one, then this one. So, the three answers are, yes, you can make it seem like there is a wave going across here that, exceed, that exceeds the normal speed of light vacuum that we're familiar with called C. And everyone knows the phrase, nothing can exceed the speed of light, but does this? So the answer is yes, no, or you run into a problem and you find out that lights can't blink that fast. So which of these is correct? Can you do it so that it appears that there is a, a wave moving across? So it moves faster than C, or you, you, they can't do that, or lights can't blink that fast. Okay. Anybody? Brave enough? Okay. Doesn't matter. Yes. Yeah. I had an oscilloscope back in the '70s, a sampling scope that the the x time axis was faster than the speed of light. Yes. Very good. That's correct. Okay. So yes, you can have a, a blinking light sequence may appear to, to go faster than the speed of light. That's that's just the way physics works. Now, no locally created information is being transferred at faster than speed of light. That's sort of what speed of light means. But also, observers located elsewhere might see a different blinking pattern. So if you're off on this side or something like that, you might see something different. All right, here we go again. So I'm going to erase these. OK, so now we're going to do, sec second question, a plane wave of photons approaches a vertical planar wall. So here is a vertical planar wall here. This is the wall. This is the wall part. This is the not wall part. Okay. So you have a plane wave of photons, which means you have a photon moving here and a photon moving here. And they're all lined up. Okay? All these photons are all moving toward the wall. Okay? Now, uh, the wall, the, it's all situated so that all these photons will hit the wall at the same time. So the wall, which is unilluminated, suddenly becomes illuminated. So don't worry about the third dimension. OK, now, the next thing we're going to do is we, so they all, in the first phase, they all hit the wall at the same time. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take this wall and we're going to tilt it slightly. This is a little more than slightly, but to exaggerate. So now the same, another set of photons are exactly like the first set is going to come and hit the wall. So what's going to happen is, um, this part of the wall will become illuminated by this photon before this one hits there. So there's going to be illumination front that, 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 crosses, that rises on the wall. Can this illumination front climb the wall with a speed faster than light? So the three two answers are no. Nothing can move superluminally. That's what we've been telling ourselves for a while. Or yes, that sounds good to me. Um, OK, let's give people a little bit of time. I could whistle Jeopardy music, but it becomes uh -huh. annoying after a while. Yeah. Yes, that sounds good to me. Yes, it sounds good to me too. So uh, the slighter the tilt of the wall, the faster the illumination front uh, rises on the wall. There's no limit. It can go essentially infinitely fast up the wall. However, no locally produced information is uh, ever traveling superluminally. So if you created information on the wall here, you could not have it run that. The fastest it would go off the wall would be C. So this is not locally produced information. OK. Laser in the dome. We've got a bunch of these. Uh, so now you have a laser pointer. 
Here's one. That's why I asked for a laser pointer. See it? It's up there. Okay, so you're showing a laser pointer on a distant spherical dome a thousand light years away. Could be two thousand. Let's call it a thousand. In one second, you rotate the laser pointer from your left to your right. So that would be like this. Uh, it's slightly longer in a second, but you get the idea. So uh, then you realize the dome is uh, a thousand light years away. So how fast, if you wait, you have to wait for the light to hit the dome and come back. How fast do you see the light move on the dome? Does it go slower than C? Does it go C? Or does it go faster than C? What you see the spot on the dome? Go across. Give people a few seconds. Okay, yes. Go faster than C? Yes. That's the title of the talk, and that's what we're doing. Faster than C. So after waiting a year, extra two years, to go and come back at the end of this, um, you will see the, the beam of light go from one side to the other in a second. Okay, the rest of the words aren't that important. Okay, so now this gets a little bit harder, but a little bit crazier, and then something strange is going to happen, so I'll tell you that. So, so laser sweeping across a wall. So let's call it the front wall. Everybody can see the front wall. Um, so you start by pointing a laser, uh, laser uh, away from a long flat wall. So this is the long flat wall. And so I'm going to point the laser over here so it's not pointing at the wall. Then I'm going to rotate the laser with constant angular speed. And you see the point move along the wall, right? So here are the, here's the question. Conceptually, where does the laser first illuminate the wall? Does it illuminate, oops, sorry, does it illuminate the wall infinitely far down the wall? Does it illuminate the wall first at the nearest point, which is here, or is it somewhere in between? Please think about that for a second before we get to the craziest question, which is the next one. So the question is, this wall is infinitely long? Yes, this wall is infinitely long. So this infinitely long wall has a laser spot move on it. So the question is, where is the first where does the laser first illuminate this infinitely long wall? Is it infinitely far down the wall? Between. Or is it the point nearest the laser, or is it somewhere in between? You have a vote for somewhere in between? Yeah? I think it's nearest to the laser. Nearest to the laser, okay. Okay, anybody else? Okay. So as you see the laser pointer here, this is the nearest point, but then you see it here first. So it has to be somewhere to the left. So it's, this is not the first point illuminated based on what we see. We see illuminated to its left before we see it at the closest point. So it's not um, the, it's a good, it's a reasonable point of view, but it's not the right answer in this case. So it's not the point nearest the laser. So it is either infinitely far away or somewhere in between. Anybody else? Yes. Somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. Yes. Yeah. Would it be the case that that somewhere is closer to the nearest point the faster that you rotate? The it point? is exactly that case. Yes. Very good. Okay. So it is somewhere in between. It's not A because it like takes like an infinite amount of time to go infinitely far down that wall. So, but we see this point here pretty quick. Uh, it's not B because the spot to the left of this, the nearest point is limited first, so it's somewhere in between. Okay, put your seatbelts on. Does the spot on the wall from the laser, um, does the spot move toward the laser, toward me and the laser, or does it move away from the laser down the wall to the other direction? Think about that. Don't call out anything yet. This is the $64 million question. This is the one that I got wrong again and again. And how far away from the wall are you? Okay, good question. It's, it does, conceptually, it doesn't really matter as long as you're just you're somewhere near the wall. Talk amongst yourselves. Concept question. So you mean as an observer? Oh, that's a really good question. 
So actually, I don't mean as an observer. Okay, it can be observer is another question that I've gotten into, but uh, other people have gotten into too. So um, picture the wall is a whole bunch of cameras, CCDs, and then you read them all out later, and you want to find out which which CCD, which camera was uh, was illuminated first, on what pattern it is. Do the cameras then um, move toward you? The cameras that are recording move toward you, move away from you. Something something different. Okay, that's both turned away. I'll take a guess away now. Okay, yes, I see the hand there first. Uh, both toward and away from the way. Okay, we have a vote for both toward both toward and away. Okay, good. Yes? Uh, let's say both toward and away. Okay. Because he said or just makes more sense to you? It makes more sense to you. Okay, good. Yes. Are you and the cameras in both the same frame of reference or is one moving relative? No, nothing's moving relative to anybody else. Okay, since we're most of the way through, I won't even answer to this. It moves both toward and away from the laser. Okay? So what really happens is that when I do this, there's actually two laser spots that, are, that occur. One laser spots, they both start at the same spot, one moves away, and eventually ends up in infinity, an infinitely long, infinitely long time from now. The other moves this way. So the reason why you can't see this is because this wall is infinitely long and this laser is infinitely power, powerful. But what happens is called an image pair creation event. There's two spots of the laser created. One moves away, one moves toward. Now each spot, once you start analyzing this, actually starts moving with infinite speed. So it really doesn't care about the speed of light. And then it gradually slows. And actually each of them uh, will, um, will at least will approach the, the speed of light. Okay. So here's diagrams and so this is actually in papers that I've written. Um, okay. So this one includes an observer. So I haven't included an observer yet. So this is actually kind of getting a little bit ahead. I have a paper, a couple papers on this. So after I did this, actually, after I came up with this by myself, but that's I'm patting my own back, I did a literature search and I couldn't, couldn't find anything on this, but I eventually found one paragraph in one paper by the first author was Cavalieri and the second author was Morrison, as in Philip Morrison. And they used this kind of spot thing to help try to explain AGN superluminality back in the early 1970s. But it was one paragraph and they never went anything further with that. <coughs> Okay. Equations, I can show you. Um, brightness. Okay, so um, this was actually, this image spot doubling, relativistic image doubling, was actually seen in the lab in, 19, in 2016. It's the 20th, 21st century. So uh, here, it's, here it is breaking off in the lab. Uh, we wanted to do this at my university, but it was too expensive to try to do something. And they had a clever setup. So they were actually able to see image doubling in the lab. So, um, so it's, it's more than conjecture. Um, so this tells you what you see. First, so if you put an observer in here, you actually do see two spots. Uh, so you see, um, uh, the observer also sees two spots. One moves away, one, one moves toward. Um, so much of what I said before still applies. So each spot moves infinitely fast, each spot slows, one spot moves past you like that, there it goes. Um, each spot goes off to infinity. Okay, so here's a single spot. So this actually works with a single spot. So let's say you had just one spot uh, just moving somehow, moving toward you along the wall, just one spot, and you had one observer. And this one spot is moving toward you faster than the speed of light. So what happens? is that um, you, as an observer, you actually see an image doubling event, even though there was no image doubling event that occurred on the wall as reading out the, the CCDs. So this can not only be a real event that occurs on the wall, this can be a perceived event, this image doubling. All right, I'll speed things up. Um, let's see. Let's see. <laughs> Could an observer perceive this spot to undergo a perfect event? Yes, I'll believe anything at this point. 
No. <laughs> Spot number <laughs> must be conserved. <clears throat> so you should believe anything at this point. Right. Let's see. So uh, thinking more, there is actually a um, precedent for that last example, and that is a supersonic airplane. Okay? So a supersonic airplane uh, passes you at a constant speed up there. Do you hear the airplane undergo a sound pair creation event? And the three answers are yes, it's just like that light spot. So you should have a sound pair creation event. No, special relativity does not apply to sound, so stop trying to go where you're not supposed to. And this sounds crazy, are you sure you've given this talk before? <laughs> so the answer, yes, I've given this talk before. Um, yes? Uh, this sounds crazy. Okay. <laughs> it does sound crazy. It sounds like two sounds. So the answer is, it's just like the light spot. So it, you've heard, if you haven't seen a pair of creation event, you might have heard one. It's called a sonic boom. Well, a sonic boom. So when a sonic boom happens, you hear nothing from the plane that's far away. It's coming toward you faster than the speed of sound. You hear nothing at all. It's not possible to hear anything at all. And then suddenly you hear a boom. And then if you could have directional ears, you could hear two images of the airplane, one coming toward you and one going away, one going away from you. And the really weird thing is the one going away from you, it's time reversed. So if it was, if it was playing, um, if there was a um, stereo play, you would hear it distorted coming toward you like, oh yeah, I know that sound, that, that music. But then going the other one, it's like, well, that's backwards. Paul Walrus, what's going on? I'm glad right. you mentioned that because I, I grew up with sonic booms uh, out of Hamilton Air Force Base, mm -hmm. just south of here. Mm -hmm. And now that you're mentioning that, I remember hearing that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so this also has another thing, uh, superluminal protons. So uh, airplanes can go fast from speed of sound, but I'll, if you have a proton, or it doesn't have to be a proton, let's say it's a proton, going through vacuum at the speed of light, and then suddenly you make it go into air or water. Then, for a while at least, it's going faster than the speed of sound in water. It's still going slower than the speed of light in vacuum, but it's going faster than the speed of light in that medium. So, uh, let's say you had a video recorder in the water. Could you record a, um, a light pair creation event? The answer is it could be yes, it's just like the sonic boom case. No, there's nothing to create the light. Or practically no, since Trenkov radiation would be much stronger. Skip people a few seconds. Okay, first thing. Uh, I'm just curious how a proton would even approach C if it has mass. Okay, so there's things called cosmic rays in the universe, and they come off the sun, too. And these are really relativistic. They're going very, very close to the speed of light. So then they come into the Earth, and they go into the Earth's atmosphere. And then they are going faster than the speed of light in the atmosphere. Also, they could hit other things and create charged muons, actually. And um, those muons could then enter water tanks, and that's one of the reasons that we see things, while we, we track cosmic rays and cosmic photons. Yes? Wouldn't the Chiron cover radiation be what we were looking for in the case of the yes. Yeah. yes, it is. Okay? So it's just like the Sonic Boom case. The pair creation event is Chiron cuff light. It's actually created by the medium, not by the uh, object, by the proton moving. Okay? So uh, the locus observers who see this light are said to be in something called the Trenkov ring, sometimes called the Trenkov cone, bounded by the Trenkov cone. So it gets somewhat complicated at this point. But uh, it's essentially the same in conceptually, yeah. So I thought that light traveled fastest in a vacuum. It does. I, so did I misinterpret the question when it said that it travels 1.33 times the speed of light in water? OK, so the speed of light in water is the speed of light in vacuum divided by 1.33, so it's less. OK, so then it still wouldn't be traveling to see. Yeah. So the, right. OK, good. So I actually have a paper I've submitted somewhere and still waiting, because uh, you get referees who say, oh, no, nothing can go faster than light. 
uh, that says this might be useful for actually known Trankov detectors, because they don't seem to realize that things can go backwards, as uh, so far as I can tell. OK, so you can sweep your laser pointer across the moon. I'm going to skip that. Uh, skip that. There's the Cavalieri reference. Um, so out in the universe, in the lab, things, take very, things happen very fast on the nanosecond time scale. So um, if, uh, I was going to, if I could sweep this laser pointer fast enough for you to see the, the relativistic image doubling effect, you'd have to be able to see on the time scale of 10 to the minus 9 seconds. But you can't. No human can. Right? Now, we do now have um, rapid imaging that can do that. Um, but out in the universe, things are on much longer, bigger time scales. And so these time scales can stretch things instead of nanoseconds into days, months, years. So I've tried to submit some papers. I've submitted some papers, some of which that say that we should look for this in nebulae and things like that. You should look for um, relativistic image doubling effects. And it might tell us something that we didn't know before. So this is Hubble's Variable Nebula coming up. So Hubble's Variable Nebula varies in ways we don't understand. Uh, now, it might be hard to see when you have a three-dimensional structure. It's not so clear that you get, you don't get a very clear case of image doubling. But if you could uh, find a line at constant uh, that changes linearly, then you might be able to see that. So Hubble's Variable Nebula is a place where this might be seen. Another place could be a sweeping pulsars. So pulsar beams, this is a might sweep past something and, uh, and illuminate maybe the surface of another star. There's at least one case I found where there's a pulsar sweeping the, the sphere of another star, and that light curve has bumps in it that they don't understand, which is not that unusual for pulsars. You think they understand everything about pulsars, but there are bumps that people don't understand. But it could be that we, these could be matched together, but it could be they might not be really matched together. OK, my last set of concept questions is, uh, Slightly different. Uh, this is, you get, these are pretty hard, though, at this point. Sorry. So, uh, so let's say you're in a dark room. Let's say this room is completely dark. All right. And let's say we had a single light bulb right here, just one point light bulb. Okay. So uh, when the room's dark, it's fine. When you turn on the light bulb, the light bulb turns on instantaneously. So eventually, after a second or a few seconds, the room's going to be completely illuminated with the light. So between the time when it's totally dark and the time when it's totally light, there's going to be illumination fronts crossing the walls that divide the dark from the light. So the question is, what is the fastest speed of the illumination fronts? Is it slower than the speed of light? Is it exactly the speed of light? Or is it faster than the speed of light? And there's one more after this, then I'll stop asking you silly buttons. OK, we have one. Uh, you'll be the first call. I don't know what people think about this. Maybe on the top. Faster, wouldn't it be the same as the, the laser point uh, sweeping across the wall? Possibly. Um, do you have an answer? Or you... Okay. 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 You've got an answer. Call it. Our issue is with the, well, our first example is with a plane wave sweeping across a spherical surface, which would be faster. But if this is from a spherical source, or a source that's emitting spherically onto a planar surface, could it actually be slower than C at some points? Good question. Really good question, very percent. We'll get to that in a second. But someone had their hand up first, and we'll go with them. Uh, slower than C? Slower than C. I would say C. C. OK, so we're all over the map. So it's faster than C. So if your eyes could see fast enough, you would see superluminal behavior all over you. You'd see illumination fronts crossing the room super fast. Also, these lights are interfering. And the, the interference patterns are not constrained to be less than C. So if you could see at the sub-nanosecond time scale, you would see things zipping around all over the place. But it's just because our eyes integrate for about a tenth of a second that it all comes to be, um, you can't see that. OK, another really hard one. Turn the same thing, turn the light bulb. Dark room turns into a bright room. What is the slowest speed of the illumination front? Is that slower than light or faster than light? Zero if the room is spherical. <laughs> yeah, there, there are sort of, yeah, there are boundary points like that that you can, yeah. But that's not, so we're not going to have anything 
like mathematically eliminated like that. But thank you, that's, that's true. Um, oh, we have two hands up so far. Okay, these are top five, I've never gotten those. Okay, we'll go over here first, yes. I'll still say, I'll say B faster. B faster than light. I agree. Okay. <laughs> so it's uh, faster than light. So here's why. Uh, from a point source, all illumination fronts must travel faster than speed light. So when you turn on the room, those illumination fronts that go from, from um, dark to light are all moving faster than light. Do I have an explanation there? Oh, so I published a proof on this. So here I give you a, a real simple proof. So let's say that I'm, that I'm the light bulb, and this is the closest place. And this is um, not the closest place. So, um, light leaves the light bulb and goes, let's say for me, let's put it at the bottom here. Let's put the light bulb here. There's the light bulb. So, this is the closest place on the wall. So here's the wall now. So this is going really fast, so it's okay if you don't get it. So, uh, light will go here and illuminate this. And this speed is C. Light will go here and illuminate this, and that speed is C. So, what has to happen is the illumination front has to go from here to here because the illumination front will go from here to here. Now, if this is C and this distance is larger than this, then this speed has to be larger than C in order to make this one C because this distance is longer than that distance. So it's hard to see, but um, if you think about it enough, you'll eventually get it. Except maybe on the back of the post. On the back right of the post? Right here in this room, there's this post here. Because that's a reflection. So you could actually get a longer distance. Okay, yeah, you can get a longer distance. I think I understand. <laughs> okay. Um, so. No posts. <laughs> okay. So, um, looking, we're, so I have a student that's uh, looking for flash illumination fronts uh, across uh, astronomy and looking for these illumination fronts to, you no, know, we know they can travel faster than speed like we're looking for specifically relativi relativistic image doubling events. So here's a student. I have a uh, Ndabi Mukherjee, and this is a video I'm hoping is going to run. So uh, the flash, the observer is over there, and there's a flash that occurs about here. So the first place the observer sees is a pair of, a pair of images of the flash go like this and move out on this ring. So this is a reflecting ring, and the flash was here as seen back up. So what happens is there's a second pair of image creation event. So actually now there's four images of the flash on the ring at the same time. These two are actually an image, relativistic image non-doubling, uh, annihilation event. And then these two are eventually going to come together and annihilate. And that's what you would see if you were far away. And to the best of my knowledge, this has never been seen in astronomy. And I'm trying to get people to think about it and to look, about it, look for it. Because it could tell us about the orientation of the the ring, the distance scales in the ring, and things like that. So here it is, uh, annihilating right there. Okay, um, potentially recoverable information. So it, it turns out that um, this could be of more than um, academic interest. If you were to start sweeping things with, um, or flashing things or sweeping things and time recording when you see how the illumination fronts move, you could actually get three dimensional information. When you look at a static image of something, you're seeing flat two-dimensional information. You don't know the relative distances of things there. But if you could resolve how a flash illuminates everything in that field, and you knew the time it took to get to everything in that field, and you could see the pair of events, you would actually get a three-dimensional image of everything in that field, which is more powerful than a two-dimensional image. So this is going toward um, something that is actually quite useful, three-dimensional imaging, if you had it fast enough. Uh, that's enough timing. So you would send out multiple sweeps or multiple flashes, or even one flash if you could see it, and you would measure back angular resolved sweeps, temporally resolved sweeps, <coughs> polymetrically resolved sweeps, because it's actually polymetric information. Don't worry about it if you don't know what that means. Um, and you could repeat it to build up your signal. So in sum, so relativistic illumination fronts, faster than light is everywhere around us. Uh, relativistic illumination fronts exist, e exist everywhere. Uh, relativistic image doubling, sometimes called RID, is intrinsic. You can't get rid of it. It must exist. 
Uh, it may be discoverable in the lab, which it has been discovered in one case. In astronomical settings, it has not yet been discovered, if ever, if people are interested. Uh, they may provide new information, and they may provide a new way of 3D imaging things. So that's what I got for you. Why can we neglect the distance between the thing and the wall? Yeah, didn't, well, didn't you say that we could uh, ignore how far well, we are from the infinite wall? It's a good question. It's a parameter, but it doesn't matter the, the, the scale of that parameter. Okay. So some things in this scale and some things don't. So you could be two steps from the wall and you would conceptually see the exact same thing from only one step from the wall or three steps from the wall. And I was trying to provide concepts. But if you wanted to compute actual numbers, you would have to know exactly how far you are from the wall. Okay. Thank you. All right, another one? Uh, so, uh, if you have somewhere, it's like either, I don't know, it's with, I kind of don't remember that well, but it's um, for like two stars can like reflect through like a supernova or something that look like four stars. Okay, yeah, I can go back to that. It's like, yeah, is, is that it? Is that, that's the slide that, yeah, I'll, I can, right, so this is the first part of the slide. So the observer is over here. And if this was perfectly circular, and there was a flash in the center, this whole thing would be illuminated all at once. However, even though it's illuminated all at once, if it was perfectly circular and this flash was acting in the center, the observer far away would see a pair of images created here, because this light gets to them first. And there's two images that go around like this. So that's the most easy case. But we've made it more, more difficult or more, nothing is exactly lined up in the world. So we put the flash here. And we made it, I don't know if it's an ellipse or a circle, actually. It might be a circle. It just looks like an ellipse. But what, does that help you? Yeah. Okay. Mackenzie. Um, what determines the point that the two images diverge? Okay. In this, that's the closest point. That's the, that connects the flash point to the observer. So the light goes off from the flash. And it, it comes, the first thing is, there's something called time delay ellipsoid. That's too much information. So there's a line that connects the observer to the flash. So the most, the first thing you'll see is light that goes on that line. Okay? So that's going to be the point on this thing there. But then the next thing you see is the one that goes slightly on either direction of that. And so that's why you see the image move out. And then that moves out as it goes. So, can I clarify, you see like it, the two images, just one right after the other? Yeah, you see two images at the same time. Okay, I see. Yeah. So first you just see one in the middle, and then you see two images move out. So when there were four images on there, you're seeing four images in the flash, which could be a supernova, could be a nova, could be a young stellar object that's a flaring. What about the case in that infinite wall? Okay, what about it? What would determine that? Would it be the same? It's just the line of the well, then it determines uh, how far away you are from the wall and how fast the sweeping is going. The faster you sweep it, the closer the, the relativistic image doubling occurs to, to where the closest point of laser pointer is. That's not too much information. Yes. Okay, I think I've got a question, but um, you may have to help me uh, articulate it. It, may, it comes out as gobbledygook. You said that uh, the doubling phenomenon has never been observed astronomically. Yes, to the best of my knowledge. So, and I'm thinking, well, the phenomenon involves motion, moving fronts, but how, so what would you look for? How would you know that it was the phenomenon that you're <coughs> describing astronomically? Well, you would have to compare, um, like, nebulae or rings, like rings around 87A, or filaments that are seen, like are seen near the, the Pleiades. You'd have to take images of those at different epochs and then compare those images and do photometry of the entire ring or the entire thing. You have to do not just photometry of a single point. You have to do photometry of entire nebulae and compare how they're changing. And then what happens is you know this is very specific pattern of changing. It's not just random changing. So you look for this very specific pattern of changing. And then if you see it, then you might predict that there's an image pair creation event coming up. And you can predict maybe where it is. And then you can have your telescopes increase their cadence and try to find it. That's what happens in microlensing now. But this is not microlensing. Okay, well, now it's um, 5 o'clock. So let's find our speaker and those <laughs>
Uh, so you've got the flash over there to the left side of the ellipse, uh, and you have your observer, whatever, way out. But the actual there. flash occurs about here. Yeah, right. So uh, at first it looks like a single point as you defined uh, between yes. the point of the flash and that place on the ring. Mm -hmm. And then you said like instantaneously or a little bit later that that, uh, These that two images. the light two images. Is, it's the light is going out. How does how does two uh, let's say photons of light end up at that observer's eye? So this, are okay. they gravitationally lens? No, this is a reflecting ray. A reflecting ray. It reflects. Oh. Not 100 percent not mirror, it reflects some of the light that hits it. Okay. So I should have made that more clear. Okay, another one? Laura? So I study the Aurora Borealis and mm -hmm. there are times when the electron beams are moving, you know, they're up at like a thousand kilometers and then the light that occurs occurs at a hundred kilometers. And they can sweep very rapidly, and I've never thought to wonder if that's a, a super woman, is that what you call it? I hadn't thought of that. But, but you, know. you might not need to go so far away to find this effect in nature. Right. You might find it in the aurora. Okay. And that's I had never, really good suggestion. I didn't know about any of this. I mean, I know about super woman stuff, but I hadn't, I didn't know about the double one, but it makes sense. But, okay. so you might find it right out of Alaska. A rural, but the auroras are usually <laughs> sheets, <laughs> not beams. The auroras are sheets and not individual pointed beams. Yeah, but sometimes a whole sheet is a beam, like a whole sheet of beams. The, the electrons come down and then they basically just go like this. But can you see the individual beams or is it just the sheet? No, you can see the beams okay. at times. Because they also, okay. yes, I think, I think there might be some cases. Anyways, it's, it's a possibility. Okay, I will check it out. Oh, I my student to check it out. One of those two. Any, any more questions? With all-side cameras even, it would connect your all-side camera stuff with the... The all-side cameras go for three minutes. So you need to be looking at probably on some fraction of a second. Um, Thinking back to your statement about uh, faculty giving you codes and publishing codes, for example, yes. just a thought for you in that um, when you're a postdoc and you're in the desperate cycle of trying to get tenure, anything you give away removes part of one of what you bring to a job set. So if I have a code that does something special, I don't want to give it away because that means anyone can do what I can do to an extent if I give away the code. But once you tenure it, there's not that same pressure. So you may have, especially in collaborations with people of different groups, if I make a contribution to a part of the code, I probably wouldn't mind it going public only after I've got my job security. It's so, just a psychological point. Okay, so that's a good good point, but let's say that you want to publish your stuff in a journal, right? To help get tenure. But you don't want to include the equations because people who see the equations might be able to duplicate your, your line of logic. Should you exclude your equations from the journal? No, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's morally correct. I'm saying that it's a motivation. Right, it is definitely a motivation. That's, <laughs> right. that's why. It's a solution. I want to keep it in mind when you deal with people different ranks in academia. It is a prisoner's dilemma. Yeah. People can, if they break the uh, prisoner's dilemma, if you don't have the prisoner's dilemma, you can look it up. If you break it, you can get your own personal gain. But if the community itself uh, decides that's not acceptable behavior, the whole community does better. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, somebody that has so she's, she's questions. I kind of feel like my mind's moving through the last to trying to keep up with you. <laughs> I'm sorry. It took me a long time to come up with it, so it's not fair. It's not even uh, close to that. I got all of these wrong practically. I, I keep looking at that blackboard. I keep going, like, I'm seeing it right. Triangle A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And you're saying that superluminal going from, say, A is the light source, B is the closest, and C is the farthest, that, that it's... It, it somehow goes super low, but it, to me it seems like doesn't the light from point A travel the same distance on the way to point C as it travels to point A? So it's, it's not really starting all over again from the light source to get all the way to the end of that wall. So it would seem to me like they're all moving in phase together, but to use the entire triangle to say this, this distance is longer than that distance is what escapes me. All right, I'm not sure I understand. Well, then, then, I, I think you're saying so the light goes from here to here at speed C. The A and the B yeah, we, we got that. line segment is longer than the C line segment, right? Yeah, so this plus this is longer than this. Right. But so light goes from here to here at C, and it has to end up 
here at the same, when the light went from here to here at C. Right. So how can that happen? How can the illumination front, if this was also at C, if the illumination front crossed at C, then it would be too slow because it would go up here at C, then it would go across here at C, and oh, it didn't make it. It ended up here when light from here to here went there. But where is light on the C line segment by the time it gets to the A as it's heading towards the other B? One ray's heading towards the A, the other right. heading towards the C. So when, when this light hits here, yeah. then you are here. Yeah, about there. Right there. Okay, so, so this light is still headed there. Right, so, so but that's no longer a right triangle then. <laughs> that is more like a, like a equilateral triangle if you go from that point to B to C. But, but C isn't the length of the side, it's the speed of the, of the things moving on the side. Um, that's right, it's sort of What you're saying is true, but it's not as instructive as the triangle that I gave you. Okay. Many times students come up and they draw their own triangles and I say, well, I'm not sure what exactly things are there, but I do know, as the book says, here is the triangle. If you picture things like the book does, then you can see. So I, I, all I can say is it's, there's no book here, but this triangle I know works. The one you're describing, I haven't thought through. We might be able to make it work, but I know this one works. Okay. Yeah. Um, gamma ray bursts have the nice property that their explosion is more or less at a point. Yes. And so I've done work on thinking about reprocessing of light, which basically means interacting with the medium around. Okay. So why wouldn't the gamma ray, why wouldn't the time dependence of the gamma ray burst be a place to look for this? Okay. So. Um, Since you're a gamma ray burst expert. Yeah. So, <coughs> uh, I am aware of that. However, gamma ray bursts have so many bumps in their light curve, and there are so many models for gamma ray bursts, it's just not possible to connect the two and say cause and effect. But it does seem like stuff like this should happen. Like if you had a really short spiky burst, right? Then it seems like stuff like that should happen. And in fact, I am, I'm in email with, uh, I'm, so I'm reluctant to do gamma ray burst models. <laughs> because okay. there's so many it's models so that every time I go to a conference of gamma ray bursts, they have someone give the, here's what gamma ray bursts are, and it's always, sounds like that's what gamma ray bursts are, but it's different than the last meeting. <laughs> I understand, there's a, lot, there's a lot of stuff going on there, most of which is not gonna be this, but couldn't there be a piece of it? It could be. So actually, I'm in, in email collaboration, not collaboration, he's, he's working on sort of a model for this, trying to include me with John Hockelow, if you know him? Oh, yeah. 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 So he's trying to drag me into using this there. And I'm just making sure that he dots his I's and crosses his T's correctly, but I'm not convinced that this is easily visible in gamma ray bursts. But I think you're right. It definitely is a case that that, that could work out that yeah, way. A, a short, spiky one like the one they used for the photon race thing. Yes. Right? So. Yes. OK, one last question. Um, so we know that if two light beams